Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson, back from a little time away, and so glad to be with you on this Monday, June 6th. Here's some of what we're talking about tonight. Congress is giving bipartisan gun legislation one more try, and some lawmakers seem more confident they will reach a deal this time. We'll have an update from Capitol Hill and more on the latest mass shootings across America. Britain's prime minister remains in power after surviving a no-confidence vote. But that does not necessarily make things easier for Boris Johnson, including within his party. We'll break that down from London. Meanwhile, Britain and the U.S. plan to send Ukraine more weapons. Russia's President Vladimir Putin is warning them not to. More from Kyiv just ahead. Also, Los Angeles will host a gathering of Latin American nations with a few noticeable absences. Three were not invited, one's just skipping it. What will this mean for the Summit of the Americas? And we'll preview tomorrow's primaries in California, including the race to be LA's new mayor. The front runners include a congresswoman and a billionaire developer. What in the world is Congress going to do about gun violence? This weekend brought more mass shootings, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But now some lawmakers are trying to work out a common sense gun violence bill. You already told us what you want to see, what common sense means to you. Here is what Eric, Brenda, and Jenny left in our inbox. The one thing that should help with gun regulations and gun laws and saving lives would be universal background checks. I believe that people should register their guns. They should also have insurance on their guns, as well as safety courses and training, et cetera, and so forth, in the firing of a, of a gun. I'm an American uh, living in New Zealand. And after the mosque shootings in 2019 in Christchurch, New Zealand banned all military-style assault weapons. I really don't think there's a need for civilians to have weapons of war. We appreciate the three of you sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you so much for that. Now, perhaps some of those ideas will end up in a new bill that's in the works from a bipartisan group of senators. Leading that group is Democrat Chris Murphy of Connecticut. There you can see some of the other nine members on the screen. Today, on our premiere of Meet the Press Now, here on NBC News Now, Senator Murphy told us that the negotiations are serious. Sometimes when we go away for a week, right, we go home for a week, sensitive negotiations like this fall apart. This week, the opposite is happening because my colleagues went home and heard the same thing I did. Parents are frightened to death. They are frightened to death for their kids, and they are frightened to death that government isn't going to be able to respond to the most fundamental concern that parents have, the safety of their kids. I think senators are coming back to town today with a newfound resolve to get something done. Let's begin with NBC senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor. Sahil, tell us some of the ideas that this bipartisan group is considering and then some of the ones that it's not considering. Well, Joshua, let's start with what it is considering, and that is uh, the centerpiece of which is likely to be red flag laws, most, uh, uh, most likely incentive to states to pass these restraining orders, keeping guns away from dangerous people if someone like a law enforcement or a family member petitions a court to say that they're too dangerous to have a weapon. In addition, uh, members of the group are looking at something they can do around strengthening background checks, uh, changing the system uh, so that the background check system works as it was intended. There are other provisions around mental health, safe storage, and uh, school safety, as well funding in uh, most cases among those categories. What's not in the negotiations is an assault weapons ban, a ban on uh, military-style AR-15 weapons or a ban on uh, high-capacity magazines. Also, a, a question mark as part of these negotiations has been whether they might raise the age for buying a semi-automatic rifle from a minimum of 18 to uh, 21. That is unlikely to be in the final package, Senator is close to it tell me because it doesn't have enough Republicans to get to 60 votes, although just today, uh, Senator Joe Manchin, the centrist from West Virginia, came out for it. Senator Susan Collins, a Republican from Maine, uh, told me she is uh, very open to that idea. Even Mitt Romney from Utah sounded interested, but doesn't have a path to 60, so that's where they are right now. 
based on some of the ideas that our viewers shared with us for what they would consider a common sense gun safety measure, it sounds like their unwillingness to even entertain anything on assault weapons is not going to make a lot of people happy. But how confident is this bipartisan group, bipartisan group that they can do something that's effective to reduce gun violence? Well, they're certainly sounding very upbeat today, more so than I've seen in about a decade uh, covering this body ever since Sandy Hook, that there was that uh, horrible elementary school massacre um, and, and there were negotiations happening around changing gun laws. It never ended up passing. Since then, they've had fits and starts. They've attempted. They've always failed. And there's been more optimism now ever since the Uvalde, Texas shooting that has shocked the nation. Um, around that time, there was a shooting in Buffalo, New York, um, that, was also, that also made uh, national headlines. And just over the weekend, there was yet another shooting in Philadelphia on South Street that left multiple people dead and uh, more people injured. This has become, uh, sadly and, and horrifically, a regular feature of American life. And you can imagine, uh, Joshua, lawmakers are facing a lot of pressure to do something. And that's where Democrats have lowered the bar very substantially in terms of what they're willing to accept as part of a deal to uh, secure a win. And Republicans, including Senator John Cornyn of Texas, the lead negotiator, including Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader who rarely ever touched this issue um, have sounded uh, supportive of these negotiations to get to some package. So it sounds like there is a possibility, at least, of something bipartisan happening here. Even Senator Chris Murphy said that he, from his point of view, heard Republicans talking more about gun laws and mental health measures than at any time since Sandy Hook. So let's presume something does come of these negotiations. What's the timeline like for all this? What would happen if indeed this group says we've got a deal? Well, they're hoping to get it done, at least an agreement on uh, you know, where to go with this by the end of this week. That's according to uh, Senator Chris Murphy, the Democrat today. Uh, John Cornyn and Mitch McConnell also said, the two Republicans, uh, key to this whole effort, also said that they're hopeful about getting an agreement this week. Now, what does an agreement mean? It's probably not going to be legislative language. That's going to take a little bit more time. But if they agree on the outcomes, or I'm sorry, if they agree on the contours, if they agree on the outlines, um, and they essentially know where they're going, this this could all come together very quickly, but this is going to be the crucial week, Joshua, when we figure out, um, based on you know senators entering their caucus lunches, talking it all over when they walk out of it, um, our team will be here uh, in this building trying to gauge that sentiment in terms of where they are. In the next few days, I think we'll have a pretty good sense of where this is headed. Yeah, gauging the sentiment and gauging at what point, if any, some members start to go, well, I don't know about that, or uh, I've thought this over, I'm not sure I agree. We'll see whether or not this remains as solid on Friday as perhaps it looks today. Thank you, Sahil. That's NBC senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor starting us off tonight from Capitol Hill. So we'll see what Congress comes up with and how far it goes. But in the meantime, the U.S. keeps enduring more mass shootings. According to the Gun Violence Archive, and if you're not looking at the TV, look up for just a second. You need to see this map. In the two weeks since the shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas, there have been more than 30 additional mass shootings. Everything you see on the map now, that's all just since Uvalde. 13 of these attacks happened in the last weekend. Those resulted in at least 17 deaths and 69 injuries. That was this weekend. One attack happened in a tourist-heavy area of South Street in Philadelphia. So while lawmakers try to come up with something, anything, that will reduce gun violence, what about the rest of us? Where might we fit into those plans? And what should we know about the problem that could help us think about solutions? Let's continue now with Dr. Ju Young Lee. He's an associate professor of sociology at the Center for the Study of the United States at the University of Toronto. Professor Lee, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So we mentioned the shooting in Philadelphia, three dead, 11 injured at least, as far as we know, in Philadelphia. The Philadelphia Police Department says they have a person of interest in custody. You did quite a bit of research on gun violence in Philadelphia, as I understand it. And based on that, I wonder what your reactions are to what we saw this weekend and what we're seeing across the country right now. I mean, yeah, my bulk of my gun violence research was done in Philadelphia, and uh, my heart breaks for Philly every time I hear stories of shootings of young people. Um, you know, by the way, Philadelphia is a city where 80% of the victims are young black men, and it's a perennial ongoing problem. Now, there's no secret, but the vast majority of the gun violence afflicts 
the most underserved, uh, racially marginalized communities across Philadelphia. And it's been an ongoing problem. So I think, I think the big thing that I think of a lot of times with Philly is that it's a city with a poverty rate where approximately one third of the city is living uh, below the poverty line. Uh, we know that the, the spread of gun violence is concentrated in poor black neighborhoods and that the, the primary victims are young black men who um, are gravitating to the illicit economy or gangs picking up a gun because there are so few opportunities for them to, to move up in the world. So it's a very complex issue that requires addressing these, you know, these under, underlying structural conditions that, that funnel uh, at-risk young men into, into, into street violence. I wonder if for that reason, uh, Professor Lee, we might be talking about a few different problems in the U.S. I, I keep feeling like we're not having an apples-to-apples -apples conversation on what we mean by gun violence. I think the kind of gun violence that would affect someone who looks like me, right, feels very different than the kind of gun violence that would affect a community like Newtown, Connecticut, which feels different from the kind of gun violence that would affect a community like Uvalde, Texas. And I don't know that we all look at it the same way because, well, Philadelphia is Philadelphia, but then a nice, quiet, suburban community being affected by gun violence. You know what I'm saying? It feels like we may not be having an apples-to-apples -apples conversation on what we're actually trying to address. Yeah, and that's exactly one of the big problems. Um, one of the knee-jerk reactions to shootings that happen in places like Philadelphia is to assume that the victims were all affiliated with gangs or um, illicit or were participating in the illicit drug economy. But a lot of times people are just in the wrong place at the wrong time. John Rich, who's a, a researcher at Drexel, has done some great research on this, and so have I um, in my work. Um, and we, we often don't give the victims of shootings in places like Philly or Chicago or Oakland or Memphis or other black cities, cities with long histories of black communities, uh, that benefit of the doubt. We assume that they were doing something to get themselves shot. And that's simply not the case. When you talk to people like I did in the hospital at University of Pennsylvania and interview people, you realize that a lot of times people are bystanders. Um, in other cases, you have people who, who want to get out of that life, but because of the way that we perceive them, uh, they don't have the same kinds of exit, ex exit options. So I think the kind of heartbreak that we feel when we hear about shootings in places like Newtown, we have to, we have to extend that same sort of empathy to, to black men, Latino men, and other uh, men of color who are being shot in our streets. I would also add to that LGBTQ people because there were police in West Palm Beach in my hometown that thwarted an attempt by a young man who claimed that he was going to shoot up the Pride celebration this past weekend. So sometimes you can just get shot just by being a person that nobody really cares about. That is another fact that we got to deal with at some point. With regard to what Congress is considering, I wonder what you think of some of the ideas that are apparently on the table. We heard from our Sahil Kapoor tonight that a number of things are being considered, including some measures related to mental health, possibly red flag laws, assault weapon restrictions do not appear to be on the table. What do you make of that? Well, I think that the, the Democrats have had a hard time historically moving legislation at the federal level um, with regards to bans on uh, semi-automatic rifles. And, you know, uh, I think the, the move to introduce red flag laws, to expand background checks, those are all very positive. There's a lot of good research out there that shows the efficacy of red flag legislation. Now, the tricky thing with red flag laws is that ideally they're supposed to work when somebody reports that they know a person who is at risk of harming themselves or other people. Uh, but sometimes that can take a little bit of time and it can require administrative work that uh, isn't so timely. And so that's one of the questions that people like me always have about red flag laws and how it'll actually work when it's uh, put into action. Um, and I think the, the background check thing is a no brainer. Um, the U.S. still has a system where there is not universal background checks, which is ludicrous. Um, you know, right now, People who want to commit a mass shooting overwhelmingly buy their guns legally. They don't get them from some kind of underground network of traffickers. They go to the store and they sail through the background check system because it's it's so easy to get a firearm. So I think those are two very um, common sense laws that makes that make a lot of sense. And um, you know I'm hopeful that something will happen. But you know as we've seen time and time again, oftentimes there's a lot of uh, partisanship and, and back and forth, and who knows what will happen. 
Sociologist Ju Young Lee of the University of Toronto, this has been real helpful, and I appreciate you coming on to share your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Still to come, a tense day at Westminster for Boris Johnson. Britain's Prime Minister survived a no-confidence vote today, but how much confidence does his government have left in him? We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. You know, governing has got to be hard enough with the support of your political party. Britain's prime minister is about to govern with mixed support at best after surviving a big political scandal. Today, Boris Johnson prevailed in a no conference, no confidence vote in the House of Commons. He needed 180 votes to remain prime minister. He got 211. This is a, a very good result for, for politics and for for the country. And what we need to do now is come together uh, as, a, as a government, as a, as a party, and that is exactly what we can now do. This vote came less than three years after Mr. Johnson took office. He endured a scandal over parties at his official residence during COVID lockdowns. A recent YouGov poll put his disapproval rating at 68% disapproval. Back in early 2020, it was as low as 26%. Let's get into all of this with NBC senior digital reporter Alexander Smith, who's joining us from London. And I wonder what you think this victory means for the prime minister, whether it's more of a decisive victory, more of a narrow victory. We heard him saying that now this allows him to get back to governing, but will it? What, what does this actually mean? Well, that really depends who you ask. Uh, clearly, Boris Johnson, his supporters, are going to tell you that this was a decisive victory which allows them to move on and talk about all the things that they want to talk about rather than this scandal. But they are clearly in the minority. Most independent experts and, of course, Johnson's critics will say that this was a Pyrrhic victory which deals him quite a severe blow politically. Now, it's important to note here that the UK isn't a the presidential system, and Johnson doesn't have quite as much power as someone like Joe Biden. He really needs these lawmakers for his power. He needs them to vote on his policies, and perhaps more importantly, he needs them to cheer behind him at the UK's notoriously raucous uh, parliamentary debates. Now, when he stands up there at the ballot box, he will know that 41% of his lawmakers, 148, will not be behind him, and that is a really, really powerful thing. So I'm glad you couched this for an American audience. It's parliamentary elections, I think, for some of our viewers around the world. A no-confidence vote might be something that other viewers might have more familiarity with. But this feels like, if this had gone differently for Boris Johnson, this could have blown a whole bunch of problems right into the forefront almost instantaneously. The Labour leader, Keir Starmer, the primary opposition party, was smelling blood in the water, hoping that they'd be able to take advantage of this. Boris Johnson's already got plenty to deal with, particularly related to lingering issues from Brexit and the relationship with the European Union. So it feels like if this had not gone his way, this could have made politics in the UK really messy, really fast. The stark reality is, had Boris Johnson lost the vote tonight, he would have been gone. Uh, the party rules state that uh, any leader that loses a confidence vote, such as this one, uh, has to resign and there ensues a leadership election amongst his challengers, he would have been barred to stand again. So clearly that would have been an earthquake in British politics. But even as things stand, uh, there's, there's really interesting precedent here in the UK about confidence votes because um, the, uh, you know, the context is important. The Conservative Party, are they see themselves as the sort of natural party of government. They have dominated the last 40 years of British politics. And part of the reason for that is they are so ruthless at, uh, when it comes to their leaders. Uh, is they're so ruthless when deciding if a leader has gone from being a political asset to a liability. And there have been confidence votes before that have been won, but crucially for Johnson, rarely has it gone well for the winner. And we saw that in 1990 with Margaret Thatcher. She won a com confidence vote and was uh, forced to resign in two weeks because she was so wounded. 1995, John Major won a confidence vote he was crushed electorally by Tony Blair. And in 2018, uh, Johnson's predecessor, Theresa May, won her confidence vote, and she was gone in six months. Now, crucially, 
Johnson and his, uh, his supporters were calling for Theresa May to go, even though she won, saying that the scale of the opposition, even in victory, was so great, it made her position untenable. Now, of course, often is the way with politics, people are calling for the same thing to happen to the current prime minister. With regard to this election, particularly for those of us in the U.S. who don't follow Westminster all the time, what would you say this election was about? It felt to me, at least, like it had everything in many ways to do with this scandal that came to be known as Partygate, with the prime minister holding parties at number 10 Downing Street during COVID lockdowns, when everybody else in the U.K. was subject to some pretty strict COVID restrictions, and those rules, those laws, were being flouted rather broadly and brazenly by the prime minister and the, the people in his office. Is that really what this is about underneath it all, that feeling of leaders saying one thing, doing another thing, not living up to their obligations? Is, is that it? You're absolutely right. Now, Johnson is, is sort of known as, as a Teflon politician, which basically means that, you know, despite all the divisive, wild things he's said and done over the years, few things really stick to him and damage him politically. But I think what makes this current scandal different is the sense of the public of a moral hypocrisy. And it's really important to be clear about what actually happened here. Uh, the official report into Partygate found that there was a string of boozy, wild parties held at the Prime Minister's official residence, Number 10 Downing Street, some of which the Prime Minister attended himself at the very time when the government was ordering the rest of the country to obey its lockdown rules. You know, this was a time when people were barred from saying their last goodbyes to loved ones who had COVID in hospital or banned from funerals from people who had already died. Really, really painful memories. And people remember what happened on these dates when these parties were held, uh, what happened in their own lives. Uh, and actually, what, what's perhaps uh, damaged uh, Johnson more than the parties was the fact that despite all of the evidence we now know, he repeatedly tried to deny they ever happened. Johnson is a politician who, to put it politely, has a, uh, an interesting relationship with the truth in the past. And it's you know, poll after poll, focus group after focus group, just show that the British public do not trust him anymore. And it's going to be incredibly hard for him to win that trust back. It's such a wild ride for Boris Johnson from winning what I think some people said was an improbable prime ministerial race to winning re-election with a vastly stronger majority to now this. I'm fascinated to see where this goes from here. Thank you, Alexander. Much appreciated. That's NBC senior digital reporter Alexander Smith reporting from London. There is also a follow-up in the UK tonight on a story that we brought you a few months ago, a new effort to shorten the work week from five days to four. Seventy companies there are beginning a trial run. It will affect about 3,000 workers and last six months. Organizers call this the largest trial of its kind in the world. Employees will make their regular pay for their regular workload, but put in 80% of their usual hours. One organizer of this trial run is the group Four, Days, Four Day Week Global. It's based in New Zealand. The group is promoting shorter work weeks to companies around the world. We interviewed the founder and CEO of Four Day Week Global. You will find that conversation on Twitter and Facebook. We are at NBC Now Tonight. Up next, uninvited. The U.S. is keeping three Latin nations out of its Summit of the Americas. We'll explain why and tell you which country says it's not coming either. And later, some of you got some nasty weather last week. We could be in for more. Your forecast is just ahead. Stay close. Back in 1994, the U.S. hosted the first Summit of the Americas. It was a meeting of countries from North, South, and Central America. This year's event might feel very different in some uncomfortable ways. Today, this year's summit began in Los Angeles. It's a week of meetings with most of the countries of the Western Hemisphere. Most, but not all. The U.S. did not invite Cuba, Venezuela, or Nicaragua. The reason, according to the U.S. government, was their, quote, lack of democratic space. In response, Mexico's president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, says he will not attend either. Now, despite this, U.S. officials have said immigration will remain a major piece of the summit. But how will the conference go without these four nations taking part? 
Joining us now is Dan Restrepo, a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. He has served as special assistant to President Obama for Western Hemisphere Affairs and coordinated his participation in two summits of the Americas. Mr. Restrepo, welcome. Good to be with you, Joshua. First of all, can you level set for us a little bit? Is there anything major that these summits tend to accomplish or deal with, or are these events mostly speeches and photo ops? Like, what goes on at this summit? So they tend to be speeches and photo ops. So this is, as you pointed out, the ninth summit of the Americas. I mean, it's, you're hard pressed to find something concrete and tangible that's come out of the previous eight. Um, there have been things that happen at the summits, um, and I think this one will also have things that happen at the summit rather than through the summit. But largely, they're gatherings. They're largely symbolic, um, and at some level, I think they've run their course. Um, and they're not a particularly effective means for the United States to engage with our neighbors in the Western Hemisphere. Well, we can see that op-ed that you put in the LA Times about why we, in your view, do not need a summit of the Americas ever again. I was just going to ask you whether it's even worth having these, but isn't there some value in having some of these nations able to be in the same room at the same time on a regular basis? I mean, you know, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, they've had a lot going on in the last few years between Daniel Ortega and Nicolás Maduro and the legacy of the Castros and Cuba trying to, to right its economy after decades of Castro rule. Isn't there some value to just getting everyone in the same room? So I think two things interact here. Um, there is value in getting people in the room. Um, one of the interesting things about the Western Hemisphere, though, is that there's a hemisphere-wide commitment, a shared commitment to democracy. Every country in the hemisphere, except Cuba, um, has signed up to say a dem dem democracy is a core value and that we all have a responsibility to defend democracy throughout the region um, in something called the Inter-American Democratic Charter that, was, that came into effect in 2001. And in six of the eight previous summits of the Americas, one of the mechanisms to enforce that, one of the consequences of not being a democratic country was being not invited to the Summit of the Americas. The last two were exceptions. Um, Cuba was invited to the last, Cuba and Venezuela were invited to the last two. And the Nicaraguan collapse of democracy has happened since the last Summit of the Americas. Um, so there is value in interacting with these countries, but maybe not in this forum. Um, if, because if the Inter-American Democratic Charter and the hemisphere-wide commitment to democracy is gonna mean something, there has to be some diplomatic consequence for those countries that are clearly not democratic, like Cuba, like Venezuela, and like Nicaragua. What are some of the other big issues that you think should be on the agenda? Colombia is, uh, has confirmed that it's going to participate, but Colombia is about to have a presidential election. I have seen its top two finishers in the runoff described as a kind of a Bernie Sanders type versus a Donald Trump type. Like, Colombia has two very different choices in terms of its next head of state. What do you make of the state of Latin American states right now and how well they are able to just kind of meet the demands that they're facing beyond their relationships with other nations, just internally? Not particularly well. So Latin America has been rocked by the pandemic. Um, it is a region that produced 30% of the deaths from COVID-19 in the world despite being only 8% of the world's population. Uh, you've seen 10 years of poverty reduction wiped out in the course of the first nine months of the pandemic, and 20 years of extreme poverty reduction wiped out in that same period of time. The region has been hit very hard by the pandemic, and the reactivation of the economies throughout the region is one of the central topics that will be discussed here in Los Angeles. Um, but also one of the manifestations of that collapse is that there are a lot of people on the move. There are a lot, there's a lot of irregular migration taking place in the Americas, and not just the irregular migration that ends up on the U.S.-Mexico border that we pay so much attention to here at home, but rather 6 million Venezuelans have had to leave Venezuela since 2015. 85% of them have been absorbed by countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. So countries are struggling to bring some order uh, from this chaotic movement. And I think one of the most important things that will come out of this summit is likely something called the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection, where countries will talk about and start taking action to create legal pathways, labor pathways, protection pathways, and the U.S. will support much more multilateral development finance to help these countries get back on their feet, in part to stem the irregular flow of people throughout the region.
I should note that there was a call with a senior administration official this evening, and the Biden administration says that it is confident that countries will sign on to that declaration, including Mexico. So presumably, whether Mexico's president actually attends or not, the U.S. seems confident, at least, that it will still be a signatory. Before I got to let you go, I wonder what your sense is of America standing at its own summit. The U.S.-Latin relationship has gone through a number of changes in the last few years, from Obama to Trump and now from Trump to Biden. How do you see America standing, President Biden standing, as an honest broker to Latin America in terms of U.S. policy and even in just terms of being able to be the right country that can convene this kind of an event? How is the U.S. looking to Latin America these days? Look, I think there's a very important distinction in that President Biden is going to be at this summit. President Trump didn't bother to go to the summit uh, three years ago. Uh, and, and that reflects that in President Biden, we have perhaps the U.S. president with the greatest knowledge of Latin America and the Caribbean of any certainly modern U.S. president. Uh, he's someone who has traveled extensively, knows the leadership, understands the value that the United States has as a partner in the region. Um, the U.S. Don't, no longer has kind of sole dominion, if you will, is no longer the sole partner um, that's available to countries in the Americas, which means that the United States has to compete. The United States has to show value to our neighbors. Uh, and I think this summit will help on that front. Uh, yes, not everybody is going to be here, um, but everyone uh, that matters, it, because Mexico will be represented by their foreign minister, who in large measure serves as the, for, uh, the president in the exterior. Um, the president of Mexico doesn't like going to multilateral meetings. He's never gone to a multilateral meeting outside of Mexico as president of Mexico. Um, so I think Joe Biden understands that the U.S. has to compete, and I think for influence in the region, and I think this summit is a helpful step in that process. It's by no means right. the only step, but it is a good step forward. Dan Restrepo, Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress. Appreciate you making time for us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment, including some severe weather hitting the U.S. this week, Ukraine's president making a visit to the front lines of the war, and a key baby formula plant getting back to work. Tonight marks the anniversary of D-Day. It has been 78 years since the invasion of Normandy in World War II. On June 6, 1944, Allied troops stormed the beaches in northern Nazi-occupied France. Tens of thousands of soldiers died in what became a turning point in the war. America's top general, Mark Milley, was in France today marking this anniversary. NBC's Kerry Sanders asked him whether that decision, putting more troops on the ground, could happen now in Ukraine. No, I think that uh, I think that what we're doing today, uh, providing uh, aid, lethal and non-lethal aid to Ukraine, is uh, the intent of that is so that Ukraine can protect itself. We don't want a war with Russia. The United States doesn't want a war with Russia. NATO doesn't want a war with Russia. NATO is a defensive alliance. Uh, but we can't also tolerate aggression. Uh, so we have to make sure that aggression is not rewarded uh, and, and it's not tolerated in today's world. Uh, and that is the great lesson of World War II. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, the fighting is intensifying. President Zelensky traveled to the front lines over the weekend. He met with troops and police forces in southeastern Ukraine. That area is partially under Russian control. Moscow also has a new offensive underway against Kyiv. Let's bring in NBC's Ali Arusi, who is in Kyiv now with more. And Ali, how are things going right now in the capital? Well, the, the capital was rocked by a series of explosions uh, yesterday morning at about 6 a.m. local. And Joshua, those are the first attacks that the capital has experienced uh, since the 29th of April. There had been relative calm here, considering the state of the country. People had gone back about their daily lives. Cafes had opened up. Restaurants have opened up. People starting up their businesses. So that really did rock the sense of calm that had been existing here for over a month now. But as soon as the attack happened, Joshua, people went back to their daily lives right after it happened. But it did worry them that this may be just the tip of the iceberg. Let's take a listen to one, one resident of Kyiv who had experienced and heard uh, the attack yesterday morning. 
Were you surprised there was an attack in Kiev again after so long? But Joshua, you know, things are so bad in this country for so many people. Those guys had come over from Mariupol and they were saying, listen, this is just so safe compared to what's going on in Mariupol and further east. They consider themselves the lucky ones. So Vladimir Putin is threatening to hit more targets if Ukraine is supplied with more long-range rocket systems. The U.S. and the U.K. have made plans to supply Ukraine with more weapons. What more do we know about that? First of all, is that bluster from Vladimir Putin? And if it is not just bluster, then do we have a sense of what those targets might be? Well, uh, I don't think it's bluster, especially considering the attack that uh, he launched yesterday on this uh, rail repair depot. Uh, Vladimir Putin claimed that uh, he was targeting a delivery of tanks that were given to the Ukrainians by Eastern European allies. The Ukrainians say that's simply not true. Uh, they destroy the uh, uh, grain wagons that are so essential to the world uh, food uh, um, distribution. But that was a warning from him. He's saying that if those medium range precise rockets are in Ukrainian hands, then he'll target more places that he hasn't targeted before. And the general feeling is that uh, Kyiv will bear uh, the brunt of those attacks because it's so, so symbolic. The government is here uh, and he'd be sending a message out. So the clear feeling here is that there will be more attacks. And the reality is, Joshua, that those missiles are going to be in the battlefield. It's going to take about three weeks till they get here because the Ukrainians uh, need to be trained on them, but uh, they're coming and so will retribution from Vladimir Putin come as well probably. With regard to some of the targets that are being hit, we did get a question from a viewer about some of the more historic structures that are being attacked. I mean, over the weekend, there was a famous all-wood monastery that was very heavily damaged, dates back to 1642, according to some sources, and President Zelensky has accused Russia of destroying historic sites deliberately. A viewer named JC emailed, the heart and soul of the communities in Ukraine are represented by famous churches, monasteries, and other religious monuments. If Putin is intentionally targeting these famous Ukraine historical sites, could this also be a war crime? Ali, we know that there have been a number of investigators from the ICC and elsewhere who've been looking into how this war has been proceeding. Is this one of the things that's on their radar, cultural sites and religious sites? Uh, it, it certainly is. You know, this goes to part of the heritage of Ukraine, their identity. And of course, Vladimir Putin has said time and time again that he doesn't recognize the identity of the Ukrainian people or the country. Uh, so that would be considered a war crime. You're taking out, you know, what people here identify with for centuries, like the monastery you mentioned. That's a centuries old monastery. And ironically, Joshua, that has a lot of connections to Moscow as well. So they made very little distinction between their own own heritage and the heritage that exists here and of course beyond the heritage uh, you know there's all of these war crimes that have been committed against uh, civilians when the head of the ICC was here he called uh, the entire country a crime scene so yes this is right. from war crimes against people to cultural sites are being targeted across the country by the Russians JC, thank you very much for that question. And Ali, thank you as well. That's NBC's Ali Aruzi with the latest tonight from Kyiv. Hurricane season is off to a soggy start, especially in South Florida. More than 10 inches of rain fell on the Miami area over the weekend. Some drivers had to be rescued from flooded streets, and even more rain is on the way. NBC meteorologist Bill Karens has this week's forecast. Hey, Bill.
Well, Joshua, we are in the mix of a severe weather outbreak in a few spots in the country, and we have quite a heat wave coming at us throughout the rest of this week. So starting with the severe weather, a couple areas of concern ongoing. We've had a couple tornado reports in areas of Nebraska. No reports made significant damage. A lot of big hail storms reported in areas of Nebraska coming out of South Dakota. Same for those storms out of Colorado. And then we've been watching just a soaking rain and messing with a lot of people's evening commutes from areas from all through Kentucky, southern Indiana, through Ohio, right over the top of Louisville. Uh, Lexington and Cincinnati, Indianapolis and Toledo and even towards Cleveland some pretty good storms. So again, this is like summertime weather that you expect to get severe storms and they'll happen just about each and every day. Tomorrow we're going to do it again. Tomorrow may be actually a little more dangerous because we have a better chance of seeing some really strong storms, large, large hail and also tornadoes. And look at how hot all of a sudden the southern half of the country is getting. This is the beginning of a Texas heat wave that's just going to intensify this week and if anything spread all the way throughout areas of the West. So uh, I hope you got the AC going and it's going to be just be one of those periods. June, by the way, is typically the hottest time of the year in the desert Southwest and in areas of Tex West Texas. So it's no surprise that this is now arriving. As far as the severe weather goes tomorrow, this is going to be tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, already in upgraded to an enhanced risk. That's this little area in here from North Platte to Hayes to Concordia, surrounded by that big slight risk. So anywhere from Denver to Kansas City, a chance for strong storms, Wichita too, and maybe a few tornadoes. And as far as the heat goes, we already have heat advisories that are up and even some heat warnings around San Angelo. And these heat advisories will be in effect as we go throughout tomorrow afternoon. These heat watches for Tucson, Phoenix to the de desert Southwest, including Vegas, go all the way out through the weekend into Monday. That's how long this next heat wave is going to be lasting. So our spring sizzle as we wait for summer to arrive, the record highs are shown to the right. San Antonio, your record tomorrow is 103. You should be near that. Dallas, you're going to be close to your record high tomorrow. Same with Galveston, Midland, Roswell, Del Rio, Laredo, all close to the records. And look how hot it's going to continue to be late in the week. Look at Phoenix, 110 Thursday, Friday, 111. Same goes for Palm Springs and Vegas, too. So, uh, yes, it's the peak of the heat season. And I hope you're used to it because look at this Joshua from June 14th to the 20th this is what we call the 8 to 14 day outlook that heat wave continues right through the heartland in the southwest so uh, yeah buckle up it's going to be a hot and dry summer yeah hot and dry indeed thank you Bill that's NBC meteorologist Bill Karens with this week's forecast America's largest producer of baby formula is back at work after a four month shutdown on Saturday, the FDA approved letting Abbott Nutrition resume production in Sturgis, Michigan. The plant must continue to have an independent expert review its operations. The FDA closed the Abbott plant in February after detecting dangerous bacteria there. That prompted a massive recall and led to a nationwide shortage of formula. The company's focusing on producing specialty formulas like Eleclair. Those should be on shelves in about two weeks. Eleclair, excuse me. Those should be on shelves in about two weeks. Meanwhile, the White House announced another overseas flight this week. It will bring in more than 100,000 pounds of Nestle infant formulas. That shipment will arrive in Fort Worth, Texas on Thursday. And from Fort Worth, it gets distributed nationwide. The midterm primaries head to California tomorrow. We will preview some of the major races and one high-profile recall before we go. Tomorrow is the busiest election day this year before November. A number of states will hold primaries, including California, Iowa, Mississippi, New Jersey, New Mexico, and South Dakota. If you live in any of those states, election day, primary day is tomorrow. Now, two races in California are getting lots of attention. There's the mayoral race in Los Angeles and a recall election for San Francisco's district attorney, Chesa Boudin. Both cities have long legacies of progressive politics and both races could reshape those politics in some critical ways. NBC's Jake Ward joins us now to preview these races. And Jake, let's start with the race for the mayor of L.A. The two big frontrunners, at least in the polling, have been Congresswoman Karen Bass and billionaire developer Rick Caruso. And to hear some of my friends in California talk about it, they are very different people who are a little bit polarizing, depending on what you're looking for in L.A.'s next mayor. What should we know about that race? 
You really could not pick a more distinct set of candidates here, Joshua. Karen Bass, as you mentioned, a congresswoman, one of two black delegates uh, from the city, a longtime activist in the black and Latino communities of, of Los Angeles. And uh, as you showed there a moment ago, she's in a slight lead over real estate billionaire Rick Caruso. Caruso uh, is uh, little known uh, inside political circles other than his immense real estate holdings. He has cast himself very much as an outsider to that race. We've heard that kind of rhetoric before. Um, there is another challenger, Kevin DeLeon, who is polling at about 6% right now, but it's really down to Caruso and Bass. The latest twist in this one is that Snoop Dogg lent his endorsement to Rick Caruso in a surprise move, as did, as did the, the music mogul Clarence Avant, uh, who has been known in the past for supporting Barack Obama, introducing him to Southern California donor circles, but his wife, Jacqueline, was murdered in a very high-profile case uh, in their Beverly Hills home, uh, and he has now lent his support to uh, Caruso, hoping he can do something about crime in Los Angeles. Yeah, crime is a big theme this year right now, especially with this rec recall against Chase Boudin. I have to say, Jay, California is one of the weird states, and I feel like I get to say this because I covered California for six and a half years, where recalling politicians is not that hard. You're not stuck with someone just because you elect them. And Chase Boudin was one of these progressive prosecutors who came in with a policy agenda to reform what it means to be district attorney, and crime has risen in the city, partly because of COVID, and then this extremely well-funded recall election came up against him. I'm not exactly sure what to make of this race, because the crime issues are real, but the politics around this is, is real, so too. So, like, what's, there's right. a lot underneath this. That's absolutely correct. I mean, you are not at all wrong to call it weird, right? California is extraordinarily complicated, and these recall efforts really make it that much more complicated. In this particular case, you're right. You've got Chase Boudin coming in essentially on a platform of reducing mass incarceration. He is personally one of the great architects of the end of cash bail in this state. It was his case that made that possible. He's a former public defender who has sought to basically change the way that district attorneys uh, are, are cut, and he has elevated a number of his public defender colleagues into senior positions. He's trying to get away from the lock em up, tough on crime rhetoric we've seen uh, in the United States since the 1950s. Unfortunately, he also is seeing a rise in crime in his city. The thing to understand, though, Joshua, is that it's very specific kinds of crime. When you look at actual violent crime, that's down from 2018, before he came into office. Uh, in fact, all told, crime in the city is down by about 28,000 crimes. But when it comes to particular kinds of crime, one of them that's up and is affecting everybody is auto theft, an enormous problem and one that people at all levels of the economy in San Francisco can feel. And so people really seem to feel that that is a big part of why they're paying so much attention to this particular recall effort. You know, we asked people both for and against this, why would you pull him out? Why not give him a chance to try out his experimental policies a little bit longer, um, but you have former district attorneys uh, who worked with him saying they've resigned and are walking out because he's taken discretion away from them and because they say San Francisco simply isn't safe enough with him in charge. Meanwhile, his supporters essentially say if we're going to roll back generations of the wrong ideas around crime, we have to give him a chance. And all of that is going to come to a head tomorrow, Joshua. So briefly, Jake, a lot of this feels like it's a bit of a mood piece of where California is right now. Los Angeles has been dealing with very intense homelessness, the high-profile murder of Jacqueline Avant, San Francisco dealing with some very high-profile smash-and-grab robberies, and Walgreens thefts, people walking out with armloads of, of goods from Walgreens. So this feels like a bit of a, of a, of a temperature-taking of progressive politics in California's big cities, in a way, briefly. It absolutely has that vibe. There is real national stakes here. It may be, you know, one thing to consider, right, is that crime of that type is up all over the country. And in some cases, like in Los Angeles, violent crime is up as well. The DAs in those places are, in many cases, not progressive reformers like Chase Boudin. So it's interesting to see him pointed to as, you know, the root cause here. Um, meanwhile, we're looking certainly at a place where Democrats all across the country are on their back feet when it comes to crime, when it comes to tough on police, uh, sorry, tough on crime rhetoric. And so it's really going to be interesting to see how this winds out and how it ends up affecting politics nationally, Joshua. NBC's Jake Ward with the latest on California's primaries. Jake, 
Thanks very much. And hey, thank you for making time with us. Stay with us throughout the month of June for coverage of LGBTQ Pride Month. We're excited about that, and we would love to know how you are feeling about taking part in Pride events this year. There's lots going on in the world, so we'd love to know how active, or not, you plan to be this June and why. We are at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email nowtonight at NBCNews.com. I'm Joshua Johnson. See you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.